Comics panel for San Diego Comic Con 2017. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you all for uh, coming out uh, very bright and early on this uh, very bright and sunny day. So uh, to start, let me introduce the panelists. Uh, first up, we have Brandon Thomas. Yeah. Brandon is the writer of Horizon, uh, among many other things. Yes, some unannounced, but. We have Chris Passetto, writer of Kill the Minotaur, co-writer of Kill the Minotaur, co-creator, along with Christian Cantamesa. Up next, we have Donnie Cates, writer of Redneck. Hey. We have Sean Makowitz, editor-in-chief and writer of Gasolina. And then, we have somebody on the end there. Lucas Kettner. Lucas Kettner! Hey, everybody! <laughs> Lucas! <laughs> All right, so we'll just jump in and we'll go through the books we've been working on, uh, what's coming up, and, and just sort of uh, explore the line. Uh, so first up, we've got Redneck. Uh, oh, who hey. is reading Redneck? Yeah. Right. What's up? Right. Hell yeah. <laughs> Uh, so, Donnie, to start, do you want to talk about just a, a brief pitch of what Redneck is, why why people should be picking up Redneck? Yeah, uh, Redneck is this really weird vampire book that they're allowing me to do for some reason. Uh, it's, it's set in East Texas. It follows the Bowmans. Uh, there's a family of vampires just trying to get by. Uh, and then, um, and I'm not trying to spoil anything, but, uh, you know, some stuff goes awry. <laughs> Everything kind of falls apart. And then... Uh, you're kind of quickly reminded that they're a bunch of lions and that they're going to go and you know murder people who, who try and hurt them. It's great. I'm doing a terrible job describing it, but it's super good. It's the best vampire book that Skybound does, hands down. The best vampire book ever. ever. Uh, so, Donnie, do you want to talk a little bit about what's happened maybe uh, up to issue four, which they can, people can pick up at our booth uh, yeah. today? All right, so spoiler alerts, I suppose, right? You can, you can give some brief... Yeah, all right. So in the, in the, in the first issue, um, one of the Bowmans is kind of brutally murdered. Um, and what we've been seeing is, as it goes out is um, the fallout from that. Uh, because the, like, the Bowmans in the, in the town that they're in have led a very like, peaceful um, kind of a pact. Like they don't bother anybody and they don't bother them. And that's kind of been uh, ripped away from them in a very grim way. Uh, Fashion. So really what's happening right now in the book is that they're trying to get to the bottom of who murdered um, their, I'm trying not to say his name, uh, <laughs> uh, who murdered this, uh, he's a little boy, he died. Um, and uh, yeah, it's going to get rough before it gets better if it ever does. Uh, issue four, we go back to the Old West and uh, we get to see um, some origins of some of the uh, main cast. Because uh, you can do that in a vampire book because they're all old and immortal. It's really cool. Um, so the book's going to do that a lot. It's going to go back in time and forward in time and, and, and move around. Um, but that's where we are right now. I think issue four comes out next week? Uh, Wednesday, yeah. Wednesday. But, but they can pick it up today. Oh, cool. Yeah, yeah. Uh, do you want to talk a little bit about the uh, images of tomorrow, or do you want to maybe tease anything about that? Yeah, so the, the image of tomorrow variants that we're doing, um, we were asked to kind of uh, provide a cover that would um, help me explain this. It's supposed to be what the book will be like in 25 issues? It's, it's a look at the potential future for the book. It's, it's right? where the book could, could be, could be in, going. in 25 issues, right. So the cool thing about this book also is that we have this thing planned out pretty, um, pretty tightly through like uh, issue 50 or so. Uh, I just turned in issue 15. Uh, issue 4 just came out, so we're really far ahead. So with that in mind, we're actually able to kind of do an actual kind of preview of what we're, we're going to be in three years. Um, as you'll see, it's Bartlett in Times Square, and that's about all I'm going to say about that. But, you know, Texans and Yankees, it's not going to go well, right? Well, we'll see you on this panel. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we also have a preview of issue five, if you want to briefly talk about what, just to the people in the audience here, what, uh, what they're seeing or what's, uh, maybe um, give them a hint. I don't know if I can say what we're seeing right now. Fair enough. Looks yeah. like a vampire. It, it's, some, it's some vampire activity going on for <laughs> sure. Yeah. Um, I don't want to talk about that scene very much. All right. Yeah. I'll move on. I'll keep going. I'll keep going. Um, yeah. That's the cover to issue six, uh, which is one of my favorites. 
and that's the trade, I guess, right? Yep. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's volume one, yes. Volume one is called Deep in the Heart, um, and then arc two, do, do, do we have anything from arc two? Was that uh, arc? Not yet. No. Not yet? Okay. Well, I just wanted to, I'm not going to tell you anything about arc two, because I can't even tell you who's in the, in the core family is still going to be around, uh, if any of them. Uh, but I will say, shockingly, the book gets more country and more like you know just dirty and rednecky i suppose yeah it's ridiculous so silly yeah. so, so donnie I, I wanted to ask i you know i know and, and we've talked about it before this book means a lot to you it's, a, it's yeah. a pretty personal book is it have you found it difficult writing a book that's so personal um you know yeah the the first arc especially um was kind of directly influenced by a lot of stuff in my own family um, and, uh, you know, I wrote a, a, a piece in the back of the first issue that kind of goes into detail on that, so I'm not going to bum you guys out by telling you all that. You can go and read that. Um, but, yeah, what, what's cool about the book is that it's, it's, it's not only based on my own family and my own um, background, but all the characters are also based on all my friends, and they look exactly like them and they have their names. In fact, for anyone who's reading Redneck, uh, the character of Seamus is sitting right there in the audience. <laughs> There's Seamus, everybody. <laughs> yeah, that's my buddy. <laughs> uh, He'll be all, signing autographs after the panel. They're, they're all real and they all look just like that. So if you ever want to meet the Bowmans, you just have to come to Austin and they run like a barbecue shop there, which is, I'm so lazy as a writer. I just <laughs> took their exact names and just like fangs, I guess. Well, that'll be fine. People will like that. Uh, but yeah, it is, it is a trip. You, you got to meet Seamus for the first time. That was weird for you because you've only known his fictional side. It was very strange. <laughs> yeah. Very strange. Uh, so, you know, we, we haven't really talked about it, but Lissandro has brought a lot to this book. Yeah. Uh, what has it been like working with Lissandro and, and sort of this new artist you've never, you know, you'd never met him before no. he was signed on to the book? I've been incredibly fortunate uh, in my time in comics to work with some really great uh, creative teams, and uh, the streak continues, man. Um, he is amazing. Uh, when we were first casting this book, I had, I had already written, I think, three, four issues, something like that. Um, and John and I were trying to find someone perfect. We went through so many artists. And I think we both found him at the same time. We we're like, that's it. He's, he's the one. And he's, uh, he's been killing it. It's, it's, he does this thing that it's, it's, it's hard for me to describe without sounding insulting, uh, but I'm not, I promise. Uh, he draws ugly really well. He draws really pretty ugly. Uh, and you pick up that book and it feels gross. And that's the perfect, that's perfect. It should feel gross. Uh, he just nails it. It's so good. Cool. So we will move on to the next book, which is Kill the Minotaur, which just yeah. launched. Kristen, Kristen, Christian, and Lucas. Uh, for those that haven't picked up Kill the Minotaur, aren't familiar with it, do you want to give a brief uh, description as to, as to what it is? Me? Okay. Chris, is this working? Um, yeah, so uh, Kill the Minotaur uh, is a retelling of the myth of Theseus and the labyrinth and the Minotaur. So it's set in ancient Greece, um, <laughs> and it starts off kind of retelling that myth, which is, for those of you who aren't familiar, um, in Athens. Athens lost the war with Crete, and Crete decided to demand tribute. So they pull seven young men and seven, seven young women regularly and they sacrifice them to the minotaur in the labyrinth and that's kind of the basics of the myth um, and so we start with that uh, the first issue kind of goes through that whole kind of heart-wrenching process of the Cretans coming and taking their young um, and then issue two which just came out Wednesday right it's here at the con too we have that badass yes. variant cover up there oh, yeah, yeah. Um, and then issue two, everything kind of goes off the rails because we, we head into the labyrinth um, and it, it all goes crazy. So it's, it's really our twist on it um, where it starts off looking very conventional and, and historical with a little bit of modern, modern twist to the characters. But um, inside the labyrinth, I don't want to spoil too much, but it's, it's way different from, from what you might have read in your textbooks. So I know that you know historical fiction can be difficult to write, as you know, even even with a twist on it. Have you guys found it difficult writing historical fiction? And Lucas, have you found it difficult to to draw in a different time period? Um, Whoever wants to jump in, either. So uh, obviously, we're big fans of the the myth and the mythology in general. Um, 
it, the idea came to me and Chris because we were uh, such fans of the material and we wanted to uh, tell a modern, modernized version of the uh, Theseus myth also because we see it as sort of like the archetypal uh, basis of uh, basically the haunted house type of story. You have the labyrinth which is the house and a monster in it and somebody dying trying to kill it or getting out. And and so it, it seemed to us like crazy that there are so few adaptations of it in modern times. Um, and as we developed that idea, we uh, we had to do a lot of research because initially the impetus was to was just to be authentic and and give a good feeling to the reader. And then we started discovering that there is a very deep uh, uh, crossover between uh, ancient Greece, uh, ancient Greek history and life, and the myth that they created. So that things like their coins had a labyrinth on it, um, and um, and so we we really started to see how um, how deep the rabbit hole went. And there is a lot of stuff in the in the book that um, people don't usually know about that is actually um, really interesting. And Lucas, we have uh, I guess Shelley can go a little forward. We have a preview of issue three if people want to cool. see it. Lucas has. has you enjoyed working on this this setting, or has oh, it been? Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. <laughs> you can lie as well if you hated it. <laughs> Just say you loved it. Oh, I, I did love it. Yeah. Uh, um, have you have you found anything? Is there anything in particular that you've enjoyed on the book, like uh, working in the setting, or anything that you've really like dug into and you you didn't expect to enjoy? Anything like that? Yeah, I didn't ex- I didn't expect to enjoy doing all the uh, like the historical visual research, but I really did because it turns out that a lot of the best. Uh, a lot of the best reference for that kind of stuff isn't it, it's it's all in ki- in the kids section, like it's uh, all those old illustrated you know uh, books about ancient Greece with the like, cool cross sections of like what the insides of houses look like and palaces and stuff like that, and uh, there actually wasn't nearly as much reference for ancient Crete as I thought there was. You know everybody kind of remembers their textbooks and they're like oh yeah ancient Crete looks like this and you know with the Reverse columns and everything, but it was uh, the, a lot of that is just like artist renditions and speculation and stuff. They they don't really have <laughs> quite as much in the way of like artifacts and stuff. So, um, and for the other side of it, I mean, like you know, there's a whole other outlandish, you know, unexpected side to the series, and that like kind of uh, uh, almost like otherworldly stuff is like was really really fun to design and draw and to kind of fit into that. You know, familiar ancient Greek world. So. It's like it's like your wheelhouse too. Kinda. Like yeah, I, I like when, when Lucas came on, because kind of squicky and, and yeah. veiny and <laughs> glistening. Well, for those who don't know, Lucas actually was uh, Skybound's first artist on Witch Doctor, where he drew a lot of squicky, veiny, weirdo stuff. Yeah. So it was a natural <laughs> fit when yeah. 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 Squeaky and veiny, that's how we'll describe <laughs> the Minotaur. Uh, so, I, you know, as, as co-writers, I, I'm sort of curious if you could describe your, your process and, and, you know, it's, do you guys bounce each other, our ideas off of each other and, and somebody writes it? How, how does your process differ, differ from, you know, people that write solo? We fight a lot. <laughs> <laughs> We're in a yeah. fight right now, so I, I'm not, I'm not looking, looking him in the eye. Yeah. No, uh, <laughs> it's, like, it's very violent. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, like, we, there's a lot of bouncing ideas off each other, a lot of, like, here's a draft, look at it, I hate this. And, <laughs> that's and like, usually the reaction I get. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's my reaction. Though. That's also yeah. Sean's reaction. That's editor of the book, yeah. Yeah, so we, we actually have to team up to beat Sean. <laughs> like, we can't let Sean get us. <laughs> so, um, yeah, but, but it's good. It's good having that, that immediate <clears throat> feedback from someone um, who you know is going to be honest with you. <laughs> Well, I know also that you guys come from outside of comics. You guys, this is your, your first comic. Has it been, how, how have you found, you know, the differences in medium? How has it been changing to, to comics and, and writing for comics? Uh, well, it, it has been different and, and fascinating and a learning experience for sure. And, um, you know, the, just to take a step back to answer the question by talking about our process, Chris and I have been working on a lot of different media together. We worked on video games together. We've worked on a movie together, and and now a comic. And I feel like the unifying force between all of that is that we work together intimately on the concept, and we outline it pretty tightly so that we know where we're going on this journey. And and then we sort of separate 
and divide up and divide and conquer and then we just rewrite and rewrite and they say <laughs> writing is rewriting and that's really true and then you work with Sean and you really learn what that means um, <laughs> but but just but in, so so working on a comic for us was um, as fans it was a dream come true and in, in terms of like how do you actually put the words in a format that is functional for people like Sean and Lucas to actually make sense of it. It is a little different from a movie, um, especially because you, you write a lot more visually. Uh, a, a movie, the, the 101, the screenwriting, screenwriting 101 for a movie is don't put camera directions, don't be too specific because you're doing another person's job, which is the director. Um, and for a comic, you are a little more specific. You, you kind of want to kind of work some of those ideas in there. Um, so that was the biggest difference that personally I spotted. I don't know what, what you think. Yeah. Lucas, has it been interesting? I mean, you know, with, with this being their first comic, have you been able to pick up their scripts you, pretty you well would, and run with them, or, or if have you, you enjoyed if you the read process? The scripts I got, you would not know it's their first comic. Like, they, they knew exactly what they were doing visually, they knew exactly how much direction to give. Well, that's um, infuriating. <laughs> well, no, I, mean, actually, I, I think that's something that we uh, do pretty well. Is, we work with a, a lot of creators like Chris Dingus on Manifest Destiny that have never written comics before, and we bring them into Skybound and teach them how to write comics. And by the time it reaches the artist, it, it feels like a, a professional thing. So um, <laughs> it's a learning process on both sides. Yeah, you're taking all the credit. Yeah, so Sean yeah. taking all the credit <laughs> yeah, for well, it. I mean, I should. Uh, I've been here for five years. Uh, Robert's not on this panel. I can fully take credit for everything Skybound has become. Um, <laughs> Well, moving, moving on to our next book, they, uh, we actually just announced this. Uh, first time writer, uh, artist extraordinaire, Dan Panosian, is going to be doing slots in October. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Dan couldn't be here with us this morning, but, but Sean, do you want to maybe describe the series a little bit? Sure. I mean, Dan's been a, an artist. He started off at Image uh, with Extreme Studios and Rob Liefeld over 25 years ago. But uh, he mostly does covers nowadays. He's done some work in the European market. But he's just a fantastic uh, illustrator, like bar none. So to get um, issues, full-blown issues that he's drawn is just uh, incredible. So Slots is the story of uh, a retired boxer, Stanley Dance, who has sort of screwed up everything in his life. He's, he's a terrible father. He's a terrible husband. He's a terrible friend. Um, and then he gets a phone call that kind of gives him a, a, the road back to, uh, road to redeem himself. But, uh, you know, the chances of him actually pulling that off are, are slim to none. So it's a, it's a, a story uh, it's kind of set in the, the boxing and uh, mixed martial arts world in Las Vegas, which is something Dan actually trains with a, a ex UFC ugh, ex UFC fighter. Uh, yeah, this is a spread from early in the issue. Um, it's just fantastic. Uh, Dan's like writing it himself, drawing himself, and coloring it himself. Uh, he actually wanted to letter it himself, but we needed to save some time. Um, <laughs> so we actually brought this guy, Pat Brousseau, who letters a number of our books, including Manifest Destiny and, and Green Valley. But uh, yeah, it's six issues. Um, five and a half of them are drawn. Uh, yeah, it's pretty fantastic. I think uh, if you're into crime or just uh, really uh, stories about lovable losers kind of going down swinging, this is the story for you. Well, I know that uh, you know with Extremity and Daniel Warren Johnson working on that, and now Dan Panosian, we have a few artists who are writing for the first time. As you know, as uh, editing those series, have you found it difficult to work with them, or have you had to shape them in different sort of directions? Each one's got their own their own process. I mean, Daniel writes full scripts for himself, and I think that's just it helps him when he gets to the drawing time to organize his thoughts and know where he's going. Whereas Dan just sends me um, outlines, and then he draws it and then he scripts all the dialogue, so it comes together in a different fashion, but I mean, you know, as much as I love working with writer-artist teams, I think that, like, one person filtering the whole entire thing, it's just a, it's a different language, like, Dan, there's no way anyone could write for Daniel like he writes for himself, and the same thing with, with Dan Pinochian. Um I mean, hey, Donnie, you're really good. Right. I'm not... <laughs> did a book with Dan Code Coast, but I think <laughs> All right, no, that's, we can plug that, we can plug that. Um, I think you learned a lot in that relationship to take those tools into <laughs> forming you. extremity. Um, <laughs> you're also working with a better editorial and publisher um, than Ghost Fleet. No disrespect. So no, but I actually, it's. Uh, I think these books, putting out books like Extremity, which we'll be talking about in a little bit, and Slots, I think has actually led to some people on the creative side reaching out to me to see Skybound as a platform 
for artists to be able to write for themselves uh, great genre material, which we kind of excel at. So I actually got a, a pitch in my inbox by a, a ridiculously good artist that I don't deserve to work with the other day. Um, but hopefully next year we'll be able to talk about. So. Well, cool. Moving on. Uh, speaking of first-time writers, we have Gasolina by our very own Sean Makowitz. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, Sean, you know, you as as EIC, uh, do you want to describe what made you leap from EIC to writer, or what sort of inspired the idea and, and made you want to pursue it? Uh, yeah, sure. I mean, you know, we work with a ridiculous number of talented creators. So, to be in an atmosphere where we're kicking around story ideas, um, you end up getting you pull you kind of pull stuff out and get inspired to do stuff yourself. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm losing the thread there. Um, but yeah, I have a writing and background. I, I did some book doctoring work. I, I ghost doctored a couple books. So it was my first time writing. But um, yeah, I had, I had heard a podcast and they were, I, I'm kind of obsessed, not obsessed, but very interested in um, the narco drug wars. I mean, it's a horrible situation. Um, and I kind of wanted to dig into it. And someone was talking about, you know, basically what the, the drug cartels are doing is mega murder. They're just, you know, it's, it's almost beyond genocide because they're just inventing new ways to kill people. Actually, that was the name of the original pitch, yeah. and it was it was it was shot down. I mean, listen, I, I think Gasolina probably uh, hits the the more romantic side of this book, like it kind of. But <laughs> but um, so my my thought was like, what would cartels do to this is a horrible thought uh, murder people in more gruesome and horrific ways, and and the answer to that is sort of the in this book. Um, but it's not, it's not completely grim, because at the center of it is a, a pair of newlyweds, uh, Randy, who is an American, and Amalia, who is Mexican. And it's basically a story of their relationship as, you know, them banding together in a world going, going to hell, which I think is something that, um, as someone that's not too far away from being a newlywed, I've been married almost five years, that it was kind of uh, channeling it through that and how you build a partnership um, through hardship and, and trying times. So. Uh, yeah, I mean, the first issue is kind of centered around uh, a young boy is kidnapped, and Randy and Amalia have had some ties to the criminal world, and they're brought in to basically retrieve him from um, the drug cartel that, that kidnapped him. The first issue is uh, oversized. It's, it's 30 pages. Um, yeah, these are the preview pages we've released. But uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's like I said, it's, it's crime, uh, horror. There's definitely, uh, as the series progresses, the horror elements become more pronounced. Um, especially as we delve into how the uh, the cartel called Los Carritos are killing people, and uh, I think the romance really kind of binds it together. I think uh, Skybound books need a little bit more uh, sensitive, loving relationships in them, so uh, <laughs> that's what I want to bring to the game. <laughs> so, has it been difficult working with an editor, rather at, at, as an editor? Is it has that change been different, or no? Actually, my, my editor is in the, the front row. This is uh, assistant editor Ariel, who's taking over her first book. Um, I mean, our, with our process, you know, our editorial team, Ariel and John, we discuss every book that we work on. So even though John brought in Redneck, um, we're still talking over scripts and, and looking over art. So Ariel and I have had a great relationship just discussing notes, and I felt really comfortable. And also, I mean, the fact is that I edit my boss's work on Walking Dead, Invincible, and Outcast. So, it, you know, I think in most corporate situations, that might be weird to have to tell your boss what he did wrong. But uh, in, in this, it's just another day. So um, yeah, it's fun. I, I actually, I enjoy that. I, you can get really locked in um, in your own head of, of what you're writing. So to actually send those scripts in and, and hear feedback and perspective that you don't, would never be able to bring to the material yourself is, is really helpful. Well, I know I, I sort of skipped past it. We have the cover for, for Gasolina, too. And I, I also wanted to talk about uh, Nico Walter as the artist. Yeah. Uh, what, what brought you to, to Nico? What, what inspired you to, to put him on the series? Yeah, I mean, Nico is the only artist I've ever actually discovered at a comic convention that had never done work. He came up to our booth at WonderCon years ago and just laid a portfolio in front of me. We weren't doing reviews. And I was like, hey, I'm really busy. Can you come back? Thinking that he would never come back. He came back exactly when I told him to. I opened up his book and I realized I never should have turned him away in the first place. Um, so we hired him to do a, a miniseries called Demonic for us and that was like a real kind of test and try and out. And I knew that there was something, he was still raw, but his storytelling was very unique. Um, I compared a lot in my head to what Sean Phillips does on books like Criminal and uh, Killer Be Killed. And 
so when I had a script for this put together, I, I always wanted to work with him, and uh, I paid him out of my own pocket to draw the first issue. Because I, you know, as, as editor-in-chief, I probably could have got it through, but I didn't really want to abuse that situation, so I wrote three issues, got the first issue drawn, uh, and then I sent it to my bosses, and, you know, to send something to Robert. Uh, he's not going to bullshit me if it was terrible. I think he was worried that it would be completely awful and he would have to have that discussion with me. Uh, but uh, he enjoyed it, so uh, I really owe Nico a huge part of that. And uh, we're, we're far ahead in the series. I actually just turned in issue 12 of the script and uh, Nico's drawing issue 9, so we'll definitely be monthly um, for that first year and hopefully sales will allow us to go into to year 2. So, I mean, the best way to support any comic especially Skybound, is to pre-order with your retailer anything that's new or have a pull list set up because those are guaranteed sales for your retailers and uh, that's important to keep them going and to keep them uh, interested in, in the business. So Cool. Uh, so moving on, we have Horizon by Brandon Thomas. Uh, <laughs> volume 2 actually just came out this week, so uh, everybody should go pick that up if you get a chance. Uh, Brandon, I was curious, would you mind talking a little bit about the origins of the series and, and how you came up with it? Uh, well, for years, I, I used to keep this notebook and I used to just write, you know, these like kind of cool ideas, these high concept things. And for years, I had this, uh, this idea, like, I want to do an alien invasion story where humans are invading another planet, where humans are the bad guys and the aliens are, are the guys that we kind of uh, identify with. And it kind of sat around for quite a bit. And uh, kind of as the years went on, as the, the, the world around us kind of became worse and worse, <laughs> I kind of returned to this idea. And uh, I pitched it to, uh, to Sean. And we started developing it together. And I think we probably took us maybe a, a year of just going back and forth over different ideas, different plots, different character setups. I think I remember that first pitch, there were like way too many main characters in the book, so they helped me kind of whittle that down to our main crew of, uh, of four, four, uh, four uh, like badass characters. And it was, a really <laughs> it was a really weird thing because when the book came out, when it launched, we were kind of in the in the midst of kind of like election madness, and it kind of felt like we were all kind of going insane, like some kind of like shared acid trip, and it was very, <laughs> it felt very timely to put a book out where it's like, oh yeah, you know, the earth is falling to pieces, and we're trying to, you know, find another place to live, and the aliens find out about this, and so then they come to earth to trap us on our dying planet and, you know, give us what we deserve. So it, you know, reading Horizon, I'm sort of struck by how big the universe feels. It feels like there's so much more beyond what's on the page. Has it been difficult building this yes. universe? <laughs> In 20 page increments, yes. <laughs> Look at Sean knows I'm always asking. Can, can we get four extra pages this month? Can we go to 24? It's no. Sean but got 30 on his book. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, <laughs> well, I'm getting 30 on my next one. No, I mean, actually, like with first issues, we always allow them to be a little bit oversized just what? to make sure that we get. Uh, yeah, yeah, I got 24. <laughs> your, your I got 24. Is your is your Redneck, yeah, only, so bad Redneck was only 20, the first yeah. issue? Oh, it was, it was 21. We got, 20. we got 21, Donnie. Man, that's but actually, like uh, <laughs> something I want to mention before, like Kill the Minotaur is a miniseries, and each issue is 30 pages for the same price as everything else, and that was... Uh, yeah, I don't know. It's, just, it's the way it was. <laughs> so, Donnie, you haven't had any oversized issues yet? We have... Dude. We've had, like, three... Yeah, but it's it's been um it's basic it, it's been a uh, it's been a challenge, but it's been a, a fun challenge, and and you always have to balance how much information you're delivering in each issue and making sure that they are satisfying on their own, but then they build up to something when you get to those you know cool five and six issue collections, and the. The big challenge with Horizon, without spoiling too much, there is a huge, huge secret that is revealed uh, at the end of issue 12, which comes at the end of this second trade that completely turns everything on its head. So it's been, uh, it's been kind of freeing because now that the big secret is kind of in the book, now I can really open up the world a little bit. The one, one thing I'll, I guess I'll spoil a little of the, oh, we have new covers. Yeah, Our yeah. covers are so amazing. So amazing. Yeah, Jason Howard, who uh, who's done a Sounding Wolfman, 
and Super Dinosaur came on board for covers, and he's just, uh, I, I love working with Jason. He's, he's too busy to work with us uh, beyond covers, but he, <laughs> I mean, he just kills it every, every month. It's uh, just a simple, powerful image yeah. month to month. We've had some, I mean, we have amazing art, like, from cover to cover. Uh, work that Juan Gideon is doing, and our new colorist, Mike Spicer, who joined us uh, with Issue 7, has really been, really been amazing. So it's uh, this third arc. We're working through the third arc now. I think I'm about to, I don't know if I'm supposed to say which one I'm working on, but yeah. maybe yeah. 16. I'm working on 16, and Juan's working on 14. And uh, now that this... I'll just tell you a little bit. I'll tell you one secret, not all secrets. <laughs> Brandon, Brandon likes to talk. He'll, he'll, he'll. Yeah, you're, you're right. See, that's the thing about me. If you can keep me talking long enough, I'll just tell you everything. So I need like a timer. Okay, so one of the things that does happen in issue 12 is that uh, our main character, Zaya Mallon, basically announces their presence on Earth. One of, the, uh, one of the, the cool things about the book is the average person on the street doesn't realize that the Earth is kind of falling to pieces at the rate that it actually is so it's it's kind of like the greatest conspiracy that you know that earth is kind of running on its populace and she basically kind of blows the lid off of that in horizon 12 and announces that you know your planet is dying this is how much time you have left to live and we're going to make sure that you all die here so uh, the third arc is, has been a lot of fun because I've been able to kind of open things up and reveal kind of this, this secret alien tech that, uh, that humans have been uh, hiding from the rest of the world and using to, uh, to get, their, get our sorry asses off of the planet before it uh, spins into the sun. So it's, it's, been really, it's been really cool in this third arc to, you know, now that the big reveal is done, I can kind of uh, be a little less uh, constrained by, by the plot a little bit. So... You'll see a lot more alien tech. You'll see a lot more alien beings in addition to our to our alien main cast, like kind of running around on Earth or somewhere in captivity. I'm not gonna tell you too much more, but he's also there's also a return of a of, of I don't know. He's, I could put villain in quotes because he's not really a villain. He's more of a yeah. misunderstood antagonist, Lincoln, who is I mean he's basically like the Negan of our book. He's the one that's gonna tell the truth, but also kick the good guys' asses if need be. Yeah, so. yeah, definitely. So he's going to be returning to the book uh, in a big way in issue 13. 13 is pretty much like a, a kind of like a spotlight piece for him. And we're going to find, um, we're basically going to learn the secret history of how Earth first encountered alien beings and uh, through kind of like through his eyes. So look for that in uh, Horizon 15. It'll be like the, the secret history of the world is told by the victors. So it's, uh, it's been pretty cool. So, you know, with this, all of this tech and alien technology and, and, and this universe that you're building, you know, Juan has been integral to it. And I'm sort yes. of curious, how collaborative is he? You know, is it a thing where you're giving him concepts and he's giving back, or is it pretty collaborative? Uh, I, I give him, I try to give him as little as possible. I found that if I can just give him kind of like the broad strokes of an idea, his, I mean, his design sense is just better than mine. I mean, it, it, it should be, but it, it just, it's kind of embarrassing where I, I kind of have something in my head and then Juan sent it back and I'm like, wow, that's like a thousand times better. And <laughs> that monster has like, 15 more arms than I imagined he was going to have. So uh, it, it's been pretty cool because he really uh, he really enjoys sci-fi and he really enjoys drawing monsters. And I found this out uh, pretty quickly. So you will notice that the kind of like monster quotient in Horizon has been like rising exponentially because I know that, you know, if I give Juan a cool monster to draw like in every script, I know that he, he'll, you know, he'll really kick ass on the entire thing. So... It's a it's a way to it's a way to trick him into being really engaged if I can just give him a cool monster. So moving on, we have a series we launched earlier this year, Extremity, by Daniel Warren Johnson. Uh, as I said earlier, he is he is writing, drawing, he is doing a lot of work on this book, and it really shows. It's an incredible looking book. Uh, Sean, I, I just wonder if maybe you could speak to how Daniel came in to, to Skybound and how the pitch came about. Um, yeah, Daniel actually was was kind of discovered by our director of business development, Sean Kirkham, who uh, he he hosts all the cons. He's a he's a big uh, Hodor looking fellow that works the booth. <laughs> I mean, listen, he has been confused for Hodor in the past. Uh, his demeanor is probably slightly meaner. Um, but anyways, uh, Danny used to do like personalized zombie sketches. He'd draw you as a zombie, 
And uh, so that's where uh, Kirkham, aka Big Clutch, kind of first discovered him. And then he had some work come out. He did an online comic called, uh, he still does it occasionally, Space Mullet, which is just fantastic. And then he did an amazing uh, book that unfortunately went under the radar, Ghost Fleet, with, with Donnie at uh, Dark Horse. And uh, he really wanted to write and draw his own book. And he, had, he sent us a, a four-page pitch for this uh, drawn, and it just immediately clicked. Basically, it's his, uh, it, I always say it's uh, Miyazaki meets Mad Max about a, a, a young woman who loses her mother, and uh, she's also an artist, and her hand is chopped off, so her creativity is completely stunted, and uh, is taken by her father and her brother and their, their clan to go on a war against the clan that, uh, that killed her mother. And it's a real story about, you know, family bonding, like how a family comes together after tragedy, um, and what happens to them in the pursuit of, of revenge. So issue five just came out, and uh, it's, I mean, listen, it's it's a uh, it's a rough one. <laughs> <laughs> it's, I, we're working, we're working so far ahead. I mean, right now Daniel's drawing issue eleven, so I hadn't read hadn't even seen the art for issue five in, in months, and it, it kind of came to as a new reader. And it just it's one of those series that kind of hits you emotionally the way that other other series don't. It makes you like consider the acts of violence that you're. Your comic creators—I mean, not your comic. Oh, your comic creators perpetrate with their characters, um, <laughs> but at the same time, it's a, a hugely imaginative world with floating castles and airships and monsters and, and war going on. So, uh, if, if you haven't checked it out yet, uh, the first trade comes out in August. That collects. Oh no, sorry, September. September. That collects the first six issues. I, I just wanted to point people's attention to this is a spread from issue seven that like I am consistently blown away with. It is, it's it, I don't know. Daniel's doing just yeah. amazing work on this book, so <laughs> it's I don't know. Everybody should read this book just just to look at the art, if anything. Just I don't know. It's it's amazing. Daniel's doing a great work on it. There's a really quick. There's a thing that Daniel does in this book that he never talks about, but I try and talk about all the time. The main character, uh, she's an artist, like Sean said, and she gets her drawing hand cut off. Um, and when the book starts, you can see her sketchbook. Um, and as soon as she loses her hand, Daniel starts drawing her drawings with his left hand. So as the book goes along, her drawings will get better as Daniel learns to use his left hand for her drawings. It's a, a crazy <laughs> thing that is like he's, he, he won't tell anyone about it. It's the coolest part of that book. I think it's so <laughs> rad. He's a very humble, like sensitive yeah. guy, but it's like this like quiet, brooding genius. Yeah. <laughs> <It's>, yeah <laughs> <he's brilliant. laughs> All right, so moving on, we have uh, Birthright by Josh Williamson and uh, uh, Andre Bresson. I, I could, couldn't think of his name. Um, Sean, do you want to talk just briefly about where Birthright's at, where it's going? Yeah, we're kind of, uh, some of this came up in a question yesterday. We're kind of at the midpoint of the series. Uh, where, I mean, the series is planned for 50 issues, and uh, 25 came out, I think, a month ago. And it, it really is kind of this huge, uh, the, the, main, the main character, Mikey, was, for those who don't know, was lost to a fantasy land came back a year later as a full-grown adult that looked like Conan. Um, and his family had a hard time accepting who he was. Was that really their son? And indeed it was, but he was actually on a, a secret mission. Um, he had been corrupted. So at the, the end of the last arc, some of those truths have come to light, and uh, now his family is trying to exorcise him from um, the, the dark lord that has kind of uh, taken his soul. So... Um, He's still got a long way to uh, achieve his final mission, but uh, it's it's a beautiful book. I mean, Josh, I love working with him. He's had a tremendous amount of success with his work at DC, doing The Flash, um, and Justice League Suicide Squad, and Andre is just an amazing fantasy artist and a, a complete lunatic as well, in the best way possible. Um, constantly sending uh, heavy metal songs and like, 14th century Italian art as inspiration. So that's like, <laughs> that's kind of where a lot of this darkness comes from. Um, so yeah, yeah. If you haven't checked it out, we have uh, five trades currently available. Um, I just, uh, I love it. It's, it's the first book I brought to Skybound as editor, like full blown. So I have a, a strong connection to it. All right, uh, we have our other uh, historical fiction series, Manifest Destiny, which uh, is entering into it just uh, issue thirty, just went to print, I believe. Yeah. Uh, do you want to talk briefly about where it's at? And... <laughs> um, yeah, it's at issue thirty. Um, there you go. <laughs> moving on. <laughs> um, I mean, actually, issue thirty has like a has a, a big event that we've been kind of leading up to. Uh, one of the main characters is uh, Sacagawea, based on 
loosely been inspired by the real Sacagawea as sort of a warrior princess. Um, but she's been carrying, you know, she's been pregnant this entire series, and in issue 30, she finally gives birth. And uh, it holds a lot of meaning. I mean, there's, there's a, there's a, we sort of delve into the reason why Lewis and Clark have taken along this uh, Native American princess. And it's not always, it's not for good reasons necessarily. And she's been trained all her life to make a huge sacrifice. And uh, this is kind of where that, that becomes a, a reality. So uh, yeah, we're, we're coming back for new issues in September. Uh, Matt Roberts and Owen are already working on issue 31 right now. So, so it's good times. Cool. Uh, we have Outcast. Uh, does anybody here watch the show or, or read Outcast? All right, cool, cool. Uh, so issue thirty is coming out soon, uh, and that is a introduction of a, a new character, right, Sean? Yeah, I mean, um, our one. Yeah, we're introducing a major new antagonist who's on the cover of thirty, and then in uh, thirty-one will be sort of a standalone issue that basically feels like it's his book, he's taking it over, and uh, we'll really get into his head and, and how he's trying to push uh, the agenda against uh, Kyle and the rest of the outcasts. So, And, uh, you know, season two of the show was released internationally, so uh, you could probably find it online for the dedicated, uh, less legally-minded fans. <laughs> um, but otherwise, uh, it'll be on air in 2018 on uh, Cinemax in the States. Uh, up next, it, we have the the end of all things, uh, Invincible, which is quickly coming to an end. Uh, how's it been working on the end of this this long running? Good, series? it feels good. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I I read Invincible when it first came out, and uh, it's it's kind of crazy that we're finally. I'm actually now as someone that came to a reader is wrapping helping wrap up the series, but. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, issue 138 just came out. There was a major turning point in the war at the end of that issue. Um, so I think it's a very sad one. But uh, so we're, it's, every issue there's huge reveals. Uh, I mean, I don't know. We're going to see how fast we can start killing off these characters. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we actually, uh, 142, which we, we solicit uh, soon, is the end of all things part 10 of 12, but also Robot War part 1 of 1. Um, so basically we're going to... What Marvel and DC would do in six issues, we're going to do in one uh, slightly oversized issue and just see what we can do. But uh, yeah, we're, we're far ahead on this. Uh, we're kind of headed to a big blow up between Mark and Thrag, and that'll be coming out very soon. Cool. And finally, we have The Walking Dead. Uh, I know that I am curious, who's, who's Princess? Can we talk about Princess at all? Not really. Okay. Fair enough. <laughs> She's on the cover there? That we can, Yeah, we can yeah I mean, together. you'll find out uh, next month, I think. Yeah. yeah I think. <laughs> we, we, we're actually working ahead. We're actually almost a couple issues ahead, so I, I'm always careful what I say and what I don't. But she's a, a, a major new presence um, that uh, our, our team will encounter very soon. Um, yeah, I don't want to... I don't know. Robert will kill me if I spoil anything, <laughs> so... All right, cool. Uh, so we have a few minutes left. Uh, I think we can take some questions if anybody wants to line up at the mic um, and, and ask any questions. We're willing to take them. No questions? Uh, Very thorough. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess well, I could I'm, ask the panel. Um, so, you know, it's, it's a lot of these, these books are very personal to you guys, and, and, you know, you're very close to them. I'm, I'm curious just if, if each of you want to want to answer uh, is there a character you identify with specifically or a character that when you're writing them, you really put your all into them? Uh, Brandon, if you'd like to start. I'm not supposed to say Lincoln, but I will say Lincoln. It's really <laughs> aggravating. Like, like I, why, do I ha why does it have to be the black character? Why is that the one? <laughs> why is that the one that I like writing the most? But I'll, I'll try to, I'll say, I'll, I'll pretend that it's because he's the villain. But um, Lincoln kind of... Uh, dresses how I used to dress at cons and he has like the afro that I wish, is, wish I could grow uh, so yeah I, I would have to say Lincoln even though it's very stereotypical and irritating <laughs> yeah, be good. Um, this is, this is going to sound terrible but like probably the one I identify with the most being a dad is Theseus's father who if you've seen the book he's, he's really like this this broken king trying to do right by his son. And so like, I, I kind of like every time we have those scenes and every time someone talks about him and like half his face is sagging from a stroke. So he really looks this, this tragic character, but he's, he's trying his best with his son. And I kind of feel like that a lot of times with, uh, with my own son, just, <laughs> just, just trying to manage him and trying to like, I don't know, guide your kids uh, in spite of themselves. So 
I think that's, that's the one that felt most personal to me writing it, even though he's like a smaller character. Uh, I identify with the Minotaur. Uh, <laughs> I thought that's what you were going to say. <laughs> uh, no, seriously, I, it's, it's a really difficult question to, uh, to answer because uh, for me as a writer, I, I try to have a little bit of myself in all the characters. And from like the, the most monstrous to the, the most heroic to the father figure, I feel like there's always a little bit of us in each and every one of them. So I, 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 you know, it's a Sophie's choice. I can't pick a favorite, but I pick all of them. Um, Lincoln from Brandon's book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the case. <laughs> no, uh, I the think afro uh, you've always yeah, the afro wanted, I've always wanted, man. <laughs> <laughs> Um, no, I think Uncle Bartlett, I think it's pretty obvious that that's, that's my favorite dude. Uh, he's an uncle in that book because I became an uncle uh, like two years ago, and I was thinking a lot about what that means, and like, it doesn't mean much, by the way. I overthought it. <laughs> it doesn't mean shit. No one cares about being an uncle. Um, <laughs> and it's kind of, um, uh, yeah, Bartlett's, you know, Bartlett's, um, he's this, like, old Texan dude and everything, and I relate to that. He's also, you know, like a quiet genius like me. So sure. I really relate sure. to that a lot. Next. You know? <laughs> and he's got a sweet mustache, too. <laughs> there are some sweet mustaches in oh, Redneck. Yeah. That was one of the first things I oh. said. This mustache <laughs> game is on point in that book. Uh, I mean, there's really not one character. I mean, each one kind of has different aspects. Randy is sort of the, the one trying to keep his... has a Looks cool on the outside, like calm demeanor on the outside, but is kind of quietly losing it on the inside. Amalia has, like definitely my temper when it flares up so it kind of it kind of filters out there's a there's a cop in there Arguello who is uh, kind of the rational one that, that sees the mistakes that have, have gone on for the past you know the corruption within the country and within his department and is like regretful but uh, is probably is just gonna have a horrible life ahead of him because he he wants to be the one good man in the, in a bad society so I don't know. You're right. I, f- yeah. I found. I don't it- go to therapy, so I write. Yeah. <laughs> when I saw Gasolina, when I saw those two characters, I'm like, is that Sean and his wife in this book? <laughs> and then I found it very interesting. I was like, so Sean's like a black dude, like in his head. <laughs> The ideal self is black. I find that very admirable. Uh, hey, you know. I wanted to try to take responsibility for it because we've we've had a an, uh, a a powerful, endearing friendship forming over the last it's, few it's years. It's complicated, Brandon. Yeah. My my identity is a very complicated thing. Um, yeah. I don't want to get myself in trouble. It's too early well, his, in the morning. Well, his, mus- his, music, his music tastes are black, too, so that's another reason why it was, uh, why it was pretty... Uh, I mean, actually, some of the roots of it was uh, I love this uh, Robert Earl, K- Earl Keane song, Gringo Honeymoon, um, which is about like two gringos just stupidly going off into Mexico and getting themselves into trouble, and that's, that's not what inspired it, but it definitely has like a bit of that flavor of uh, yeah, just going wherever the, the road leads. Yeah. Uh, Lucas, is there any anything that you've drawn in, in the book that you've really identified with, or that you've put oh. yourself into, or, or that you've, you feel an affinity with? Uh, there's a character named Solius, who's like, uh, he's basically the jerk out of like all the, <laughs> the teenage uh, uh, sacrifices in the labyrinth, and he's, I really liked him just because he was, he's just, a, jerks are fun to draw. Um, they've got really uh, jerky, interesting body language, and he's he's kind of like the Eric Cartman of like the <laughs> second place group. He's just he's he's always complaining about something and trying to screw people over. And I don't know, I, I mean I'm not like that, but yeah. <laughs> I like drawing characters in like that, you know. Well, they're, uh, they're giving us the, the stop sign, uh, so I think that's where we're going to have to end things today, but uh, thank you all for coming out. And, thank and you, guys. Thank you for- uh, thank we you. Also, I also brought with me uh, black and white ash cans of the first issue of Gasolina, so I'll just stand outside. If people want one, we can just grab one. Um, it's Free the comics. Full, the full first right. issue uh, yeah. in black and white, so if you want color, you got to pay the money, but uh, <laughs> that's just how it works. Well, thank you, guys. Thank you. Sure. Stay.